Thank you for a wonderful discourse. Um, if I've understood and extrapolated correctly, can we ascribe our different responses to stress to changes in the genetics of our mothers, grandmothers, great-grandmothers due to stresses in their lives that cause their genes to change? That's both of you, isn't it? Depends which order you want to take it in, the pregnancy order, the epigenetic order. Epigenetics. Um, <laughs> the Joe Herbert, reading it's epigenetics. A, it's a fascinating <laughs> question because what you're asking is, do you inherit epigenetic markers? The answer to that is probably no. Now, there's a problem there because whilst during the um, formation of, uh, of eggs and sperm, most of the markers are removed. So you start with a clean sheet. However, there are people, and there are some evidence, that some of them are not removed. So you may inherit a bit of what your grandma or your ma went through. A gentleman called Dr. Lamarck said that many years ago, <laughs> and no one believed him. But, you know, he's coming back into fashion very slightly. Yeah, from a sort of psychological and psychosocial point of view, there is quite a lot of work looking at intergenerational transmission of stress. Um, the degree to which that is a genetic component, I, I, I couldn't say, um, but there certainly is evidence um, of people, for example, who have survived the Holocaust and looking at the adult um, children of those people, and they also have altered cortisol levels. Yes. Um, oh, but as to why, that, that, that is still really a mystery. Yes. Thank you. We've got one question here, and then a second question there. This is one for uh, Julie. It's about the section of your talk when you... I'm here. Sorry, you were struggling to see me. Um, uh, Where well, you were talking about the different uh, stress responses to different levels or qualities of childcare. For the rest of your talk, uh, I understood that most often the level of cortisol was more or less associated with the level of stress, more stress, more cortisol. In that particular chart, if I read it correctly, the worst form of childcare resulted in the least cortisol in the morning, but more or less the same amount of cortisol in the afternoon, and that was deemed to be a bad thing. So in that instance, more stress equaled less cortisol, so it, that seemed to be different to what was being reported um, in, in the other slide. So I, didn't, I, I got a bit mm. confused as to why that might be the case. That's a good point. The, um, the, it can be the case that lower levels of stress are associated with particularly extreme... Sorry, lower levels of cortisol are associated with extreme levels of stress. But in that particular study, it's really looking at the decline across the day, not so much where the individuals are starting... Um, in, in the morning, or that could be a, a you know a different a different question, but um, it's the decline across the day that they were really looking at. So it doesn't necessarily matter if the levels are lower on awakening, but it's they, they need to decline across the day. So if, there'll be in, differences across individuals. Um, so that's why just taking one measure where you, you just compare cross-sectionally doesn't tell us too much. We need to compare across the day, uh, for example, in, in that case. Um, that particular study, it was the increases across the day that were particularly damaging. Two questions on this side, one, two, and then we'll go up to the gods. And then we'll come to you. Um, a question for Julie. Um, you said that children have very good insight into the stress levels that they're experiencing, whereas um, adults don't. Um, and in a research environment, obviously part of the problem might be um, demand characteristics or social desirability bias. Do you think adults genuinely use that ability to have insight into their stress levels, or if you're able to design you know, a perfect experiment, they would show insight into their stress? Um, I think there are two things. Maybe they, they partly lose that insight because they think that they're coping very well um, because of the experience of um, coping. Uh, but also, I think, in that situ those situations, experimentally, they don't want to admit to the... Sorry, I can't see where... Ah, yes. Um, they don't necessarily want to admit to the experimenter that they were feeling um, stressed. So there's, there's a bit of bias in, in that sense. I could actually and ask you, is there a gender difference in this? I expect males to be much less... 
<laughs> We're all interested, Joe. I, I'm trying to recover myself from earlier on. <laughs> um, male to much less uh, willing to admit stress than women. Is that true? Well, in that social stress situation in the laboratory, mm. men... In their in cortisol levels increase much to a much greater degree yes, than women. Found, but yes. I just um, anecdotally, I would say men are less likely to um, admit to finding it stressful, particularly to a female experimenter. Anic- <laughs> <laughs> this is the Too Royal sure. Institution. It runs on evidence, and she said anecdotally. <laughs> Hi. Thank you um, very much. This is for um, the, gen- the first gentleman. Um, in one of his um, slides, he had mentioned that cortisol inhibits the formation of new nerve cells uh, in the brain. I was just wondering, number one, how? And also, when you're under a lot of stress, have they done any studies for behavior? If you've been under a lot, a lot of stress for a long time, uh, does that mean with the less nerve cells, I'm not a science person, but I mean, does that lead to some sort of disease? Yes, the part of the brain we're talking about is called the hippocampus, and it's, I haven't mentioned it so far because it's too much in 15 minutes, but it's part of the brain we're particularly concerned with uh, forming new memories and of um, uh, remembering things like where things are. For example, there was a famous study a few years ago which showed that London taxi drivers had particularly big hippocampi because they had to learn their way around London. This was the day before Saturnav, of course, where they had to spend two years doing, doing things called the knowledge, which they had to pass an exam. It now, wouldn't work with Uber drivers, I'm pretty <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay. It wouldn't work with me either, I tell you. Now, what happens, the extraordinary thing about the hippocampus is, and it is very extraordinary, is that unlike nearly all the rest of the brain, it goes on making new nerve cells in adult life, in you, as well as rats and mice, as has been demonstrated in humans. That's completely against what we thought 20 years ago. When I was a medical student, 100 years ago, the, um, uh, I was taught that the brain never made new neurons. And that was really a, an inheritance from a very famous uh, neur- uh, neur- uh, neuroscientist called Ramon I. Cajal, who more or less founded neuroscience in the early part of the late part of the the ninth century. And he said, the brain can never make new neurons, they can only die. And that was believed until about 1970 or 1980, when two parts of the brain, and hippocampus is one, were found to be... Now, one of the things that cortisol does is, it stops that stone dead. And you can demonstrate that very clearly. Does that matter? We don't know that. The reason being is that in human beings, you can't actually see this process in the living brain. Our scanning techniques aren't good enough. What you can do is see it in post-mortem brain. It's a bit late to ask them about memory by then. And you can ask them, you can of course do it in in rats. In rats, it does make a difference. You can can demonstrate certain deficits in memory, particularly, for example, um, differentiating two sorts of closely linked memories, which rats can do rather well. If, if you uh, reduce this process, which is called neurogenesis, they do it less well. But it's a fascinating area. It's also been, been associated with the development of depression because one of the things that the drugs used for depression do, SSRIs like uh, Prozac, is increase neurogenesis markedly. And people have wondered whether that's the reason why they act as antidepressants. But it's still subject to speculation. Um, i just maybe add something to what Joe has said, uh, which is that in addition to tissue loss in the hippocampal formation, you get tissue growth in the amygdala. Uh, it actually gets larger in size, uh, which means that uh, people who are subject to stress uh, show this characteristic uh, syndrome that is associated with hypervigilance and fear uh, responses to in relatively innocuous stimuli in the environment. And you also get a a remarkable phenomenon in the frontal lobes where metabolically their activity tends to drop, um, which makes good sense because people are uh, under high conditions of stress. They're not so good at forming intentions and interrogating their own memories. Just to add to that, if I may, 
Shane's talks, this is a very interesting point because he's demonstrated there are various ways which the brain can change. The amygdala doesn't make new neurons, but it changes connections, the same with the frontal lobe. So the brain is very plastic, but plastic in different ways. Uh, we have one question from the gods, and then we have uh, one, two, three down, down here. Well, very quickly, I've lived in South Africa, especially in 96, 97, and 2000, after apartheid, and I've been with the ANC from 1976, where a lot of children were tear-gassed and slaughtered, and they had dogs set on them and all sorts of atrocities. I'm just wondering if that was part of an experiment of some type. And I've seen the effects of people who have been in solitary confinement for very long periods of time. I'm just wondering what was the point of it all, for the minority to rule the majority, but to go on for so long and to be so horrendous. I, I think the, the point of, of, of Shane's work and Shane's book is, is that there is, there is no, no, no point. There would be no advantage for those people, no information gained from those people. And, and one of the things I, I, I think that's worth mentioning, Shane didn't mention it in his talk, is, is the effect that torturing has on the torturers. Uh, they suffer a great deal of, of, of PTSD and readjustment uh, uh, problems because they're not immune, once, especially once they leave that supportive event. <laughs> Uh, an environment. Uh, I, I think that's what I, I would I would say to that question. It's a shame you haven't got Archbishop Tutu here. It's that that, that is a shame. Yeah, that's <laughs> definitely. Uh, Take care. Uh, a, a shame. I'd give him a book anyway. Uh, so we have we have two questions. We have one, three questions. One here. Got you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. If you modify. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> If you modify genes, will you be able to modify the amount of stress a human can take before they kind of start getting extremely uncomfortable? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what did you have in mind? What, what, you're, you're sat in between your parents, what's going wrong? <laughs> did you have a, th a specific kind of thing in mind, like sports or stress or exams? No? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We've got two more questions down here. One here, front, and one there. And oh, uh, it's my turn, is it? It is yours. You have the microphone. Oh, thank you. <laughs> but that's, that's the clue. That's follow. <laughs> well, my, my impression is that uh, you have discussed uh, stress due to um, actual uh, events and states. But um, what about the uh, stress that uh, can come about due to um, uh, non-existent and imaginary states and events? Anxiety, rumination, depression. Mm. Hallucinations, you mean? Do you mean hallucinations, or do you mean anxiety states that would cause people to ruminate on stressful situations yeah. over, uh, and, uh, over uh, and over again? Any, anything that uh, stress that you imagine yourself without uh, any kind of external evidence. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the reverse of, of one of the things that none of the three speakers have, have spoken about, which is what would be the remedies for, for some, of the stressful, uh, uh, some of the stressful events that people would go through. Um, and one of, the, one of the remedies in things like CBT would be to imagine uh, yourself coping with stressful situations, minimizing the stressful situations. So I think what you're referring to is the exact opposite of that, overthinking the stressful situations and causing those biological effects that, mm. that would have otherwise be caused by um, external circumstances. Uh, so I think you could apply what you're thinking of to everything as internal torture, if you like, or an internal first day at school, um, uh, which would have exactly the same kinds of effects on the brain as, uh, as real external stress events. And in fact, almost anything that you imagine has the same effects on the brain as things that really happen. So if you imagine throwing a ball, for example, the same parts of your brain are active as if you are really throwing the ball. And if we take it more conceptually, removed from, from physical actions and think about thinking about stressful sh situations, um, then you would have the same parts of the brain um, um, uh, activated by thinking about stressful situations as you would by actually <laughs> being in the stressful situations. Yes, if I could add to that. Uh, I, I wish you would, I'm not the expert. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the, as I said, uh, the stress response, the experience of stress, is a neural phenomenon in, in your head, okay? Uh, yeah. uh, and the cause of that is manifold. 
Now, it can be actually absent in the same way as a, 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 you can imagine things, have a dream or hallucination, for example. I mean, you think you're seeing me now, don't you? You're not, in fact, at all. What's happening is something's happening in your head which is saying, out there, there's a bloke with a white beard I haven't seen before who's talking about stress. Now, for all you know, I'm not here. You're in a dream. Now, if, for example, I gave you a certain drug, I have no idea what that could be. Which you've had. Oh, which I've had. Um, uh, you might imagine someone like me sitting here. I, mean, I probably have, you know, green hair and I have claws and things. So what, what I'm saying is that, that, the, that the experience of stress, the cognitive emotional experience, is always internal. And that can be generated by a variety of things. So you're quite right. It could be entirely imaginary. Although, of course, to you it wouldn't be imaginary, it'd be real. A, a comment and a proposal based on uh, <clears throat> current events. One of the candidates for president of the United States might have benefited, actually, from your talk in that <laughs> he promises, if he's elected, uh, to enhance the kind of uh, interrogation efforts that the CIA and Guantanamo have used. Uh, I doubt that he would have actually learned anything from your talk, but the fact is that is one of his uh, proposals. And in terms of, of a proposal, Unhappily, we're going through right now a period of, of maximum stress in many countries of, of very young children, the ones who have been displaced from Syria and other countries, and uh, those who have survived the boat trips. Uh, and this, unfortunately, I mean, it's sort of a, a natural social experiment to look at the extent to which various children exposed to various kinds of extraordinary stressors uh, are able or not able to cope over the next years. And I just you know, wonder whether there's any provision in place to try to, uh, to harness this horrible social experiment that we're witnessing. Is it a research opportunity in a, a dark sense? Mm, um, it certainly is. I mean, I, I'm not aware of any research, at least in the UK, that is, is currently ongoing. But I'm sure there is. Uh, you know, there are research programs that are starting up in that area. Um, and certainly um, previous events that have happened, so 9-11 um, and a you know, number of different terrorist um, events, there are, there's quite a lot of research that has looked, for example, at um, women who were pregnant um, at the time of the, the bombing and those, those sorts of studies. So, you know, people to... Um, tend to um, go after those those sorts of events. I mean, I mean that in the uh, and I think, way. Sorry, so, are you uh, going to carry on? No, that's fine. Yeah. Well, one of the things that's come out of those kinds of studies, 9-11 and uh, Rwanda, for example, is, is that, that frequently um, having an external... Um, a cure, if you like, uh, uh, counselling help for the for the stress uh, response too early can have n counter um, uh, counter effective results as opposed to leaving people for a, a period of, of months while the normal biological responses learn to deal with those those stress responses. And just as a just to clarify as as a point, uh, when you say that one of the candidates wouldn't have learned anything from Shane's talk, was that a comment on the talk or the candidate? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I thought so. So we have a question. Where is the microphone? It's there. Okay. Uh, hi. Thanks very much, first of all. It's been really interesting, uh, everything that you said. Um, I was wondering uh, particularly about depression. Um, depression has been, uh, it's become quite prominent uh, specifically today, and we don't hear much about it in history. Uh, so I was wondering, is that because um, of increased awareness, or is that because in today's society, people are more depressed than they were? And also, what are your thoughts about um, the future? I mean, obviously, you can't predict the future, but um, do, you can, see, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you see uh, depression on the rise? I'm not a psychiatrist, I should tell you that. Uh, there is one in the audience, actually. But uh, um, the, there's a big, that's a big debating point. There's no doubt about it that the prevalence of depression is much higher now than it was, say, 50, 60 years ago. We also know that even today, in this supposedly developed country, a large proportion of people who are clinically depressed are never recognised as such, are not treated and get, never get near a doctor. A good example of that is India. When I went to India first many years ago, I was told depression didn't exist in India. You know, all that curry in the sunlight. Um, absolutely not true, because, of course, if you look carefully... 
it is just as prevalent as it is here. So it's a matter of reporting and definition is the other problem. The problem with psychiatric illnesses is that they are all diagnosed entirely on symptoms. And that's a big problem in medicine. If you look back at the history of medicine, um, because symptoms are certainly the thing that matters to the patient, and they're the, the first, port, they're the first uh, 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 signpost, if you like, to a doctor for what's wrong. But it mustn't stop there. Uh, uh, in, in psychiatry, it has stopped there. But if, for example, if you look at, say, cardiology or cancer or whatever, we all know that now that the initial diagnosis on symptoms is only the prelude for a much detailed investigation with blood tests and radio and, and x-rays and scans and so on. They don't exist in psychiatry. So our definition of depression, indeed any mental illness, is still extremely vague. That's the problem. And conceptually, there's an, an interesting, I recommend a book called Crazy Like Us, which is um, from a medical anthropology viewpoint about whether we're exporting our concepts of mental health to the, to, to the rest of the world as well. We had mm. uh, questions on, on this side of the room. Uh, we have one in the middle here, gentleman in the bluish shirt, and then one back there. Thank you. Um, question to Judith. Um, Julie. Julie, I'm sorry, Julie. Um, Unless there's something we don't know about you two at the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's Julie you meant. I don't think there's any other lady in the panel. <laughs> um, you mentioned in your studies on children, that, especially when they were in front of the, um, the board of children, that some of the children developed a resilience to the stress that they were put under. Now, if that is true, that is a very important finding. Would you like to elaborate on that? Mm. Well, I wouldn't say they developed a resilience because we weren't repeatedly doing it and looking at it over time. But, but yes, yeah, some of them were more able to cope um, with that. Um, and this was actually a study that was done by one of my PhD students, who I'm sure is here, but I won't embarrass her, um, and she'll be able to tell you more about it. But um, in that study, um, we did look at coping responses, and, and we're currently looking following up that data, and we haven't um, actually written up that data yet. Um, but one of the things that some of the children who coped better said was that they realised that in that environment, they didn't have any control. Because remember, I said one of the characteristics of stress is lack of control. The ones that realised that they, they didn't have any control, so they stopped trying to control the environment. They just reacted more emotionally. Um, those ones seemed to be coping better. So it, it was the fit with the environment, if that answers your question. Well, <laughs> ah. You'll have to wait till the next um, paper comes out. Uh, we'll take man with beard and then lady without beard, because you're very close to each other, <laughs> just to be clear. Um, I had two, actually. One was the relationship between stress, fear, and anxiety. And, um, and the second one was on the torture point, uh, I was really, I mean, it's interested to see about the, you know, it's in, ineffective as a way of evoking memory, but I, in a way, having never thought about it before, I would have thought that torture was about overcoming resistance and breaking will rather than somehow evoking memory. Do you mind if we just take the second question? Because there there's 15 minutes and lots of other questions, but I think the second question, I was more interested in the second question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so... Here's where the fissure lies. Um, there's no meaningful or useful concept in psychology uh, or in understanding brain function where breaking the will is concerned. Uh, this is a metaphor uh, which is utterly and completely useless. It, it doesn't map onto anything that we know about how executive functions are realized in the brain. It doesn't map onto anything we know about intentions or any of those kinds of things. And this metaphor is widely employed when you look at policy documents and other things. Uh, but when you actually then go and look at the consequences, uh, when you see whether or not useful intelligence of any description has been harvested, what you find is no. But the, the rationale that's offered, uh, regrettably, by uh, uh, usually uh, uh, amateurs in the area, I'm not, not saying you're an amateur torturer, uh, <laughs> is that what it will do is break the will. So the, the Abu Zubaydah, whom I mentioned there, he was uh, one of the first people who was to be subjected to this program of will-breaking. And uh, his, the, he had been first interrogated by Ali Soufan, who was a, a well-known FBI interrogator who, uh, through 
building rapport, giving the guy a cup of tea, uh, uh, famously a, a, a can of a, a soft drink or some, of some description. Uh, he spoke at length and gave up great volumes of information. Uh, when Mitchell and Jessen, uh, who were the, the two CIA torturers who, who are currently being chased through the courts in the US, arrived on the scene, they came along with this idea that we will break his will, we will get rid of his resistance. Um, and uh, their first estimate was that, well, if we sleep deprive him for up to a month and we, water, uh, we waterboard him for about a month, he will tell us everything we want to know. Then after 30 days, they said, well, actually, we, when we said 30 days, we meant 60 days. Uh, and this is the kind of thing, you get an escalation of the brutality um, because the metaphor that you start with which is that there is a, a wall to be overcome, there's a resistance to be broken down, does not map in any meaningful way to any underlying psychological concept. So you have to set it aside as a, a myth propagated by television, um, but it's not something that actually maps to anything real inside the brain. But what you do actually end up breaking is the exact system which you want to retrieve information yeah. from. And that, I mean, yeah. you can't retrieve it. The lady behind you had a question. Hi. Second presentation, it was mentioned briefly that children with lower levels of cortisol in initially starting school had higher risks of having uh, illnesses later, as in like during school. And I assume this is referencing to non-stress related illnesses. Uh, why is that trend so prominent? Um, well, in that study, we were looking at the common cold and flu, so common ac acute um, illnesses. It wouldn't necessarily generalise to, to all illnesses. This is just a sort of paradigm for, for illness. Um, and the idea there being that they were those who were more able to mount a stress response seemed to be the ones that were more um, able to, to cope with stress, and those were the ones who were less likely to become ill. I, I like short questions and short answers. I'm getting very stressed now because I keep nodding at people encouragingly and I know that I've already lied to at least one person about taking your question. We're going to take a question from the top there, then we're going to take one from here, then one from there, and then go to the back there, if we can. So a question from the gods. Uh, good evening. Um, in the first talk, uh, cortis uh, we were told that cortisol inhibits the formation of new s nerve cells in the brain but that it also reinforces aversive memories. How does it exactly reinforce aversive memories? We're back to the amygdala again, which is what Shane's talking about. That's a, um, um, the area of the brain where particularly fearful or uh, uh, dangerous memories are, are reinforced. And uh, it's thought that cortisol, together with, actually with another compound, a noradrenaline or adrenaline in the brain, acts in that area to reinforce that area there. Clearly, biologically, very important. If you, let's imagine, let's go back a few thousand years, shall we, and you're walking through the forest looking for your lunch, which is a deer or something, and you come across a sleeping tiger. Well, now, uh, you want to remember that. You don't get there again. And that's really why uh, a, a, acute, uh, fearful memories are imprinted much better when you're stressed. Try yes. Again? yes. Uh, we've heard that um, a lack of stress or a reduction in stress is good for uh, depression, it's good for uh, bringing up kids, and it's good for getting uh, confessions out of uh, victims. Uh, can, can the three people on the panel please give us their best guess at how to, redu how to reduce stress? <laughs> we, we know uh, quite a lot about it. Um, uh, first of all, as Joe emphasised, stress is a perceptual phenomenon. It, 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 it's what you're thinking. But if you want to build uh, resilience, there are a couple of things that are really important. Uh, aerobic exercise, and lots of it, uh, is, a, is a universal hygiene where stress is concerned. The other is something that people forget, the best cognitive enhancer we have. Lots of sleep. Good quality sleep at length is a... Uh, okay. Uh, Julie, what's the best reducer of stress? I would add to those health behaviours by saying social support. That would yeah. be the number one. Joe, me. best reducer of stress? Well, I think it's available, really. That's good. I mean, yes, I mean, it's attitude, isn't it, really? Um, I, I think one way is to avoid giving talks to the RI would be a good way. <laughs> <laughs> you do despair of scientists sometimes. I mean, it's sex and chocolate is the answer. I mean, <laughs> uh, and... 
uh, and empirical evidence suggests in that order. <laughs> uh, uh, so, yeah, yeah, and whatever they said. Uh, where was the next question? It was back there, yeah? Hi, um, two questions. One really, really quick one, I think, and a second one. Can the amygdala shrink back, is the first one, and completely unrelated. Is, um, is there any link between stress and cancer? Uh, so can the amygdala shrink back is actually a really live and important question of the moment. And the answer is we are completely uncertain as to whether it can or not. Uh, in experiments that you can do in uh, animal models, the answer is sometimes, if you get the conditions right. Mm. In humans, uh, it's much less certain. Phenomena like uh, post-traumatic stress disorder are believed to revolve around this phenomenon of amygdala hypertrophy. But uh, experimental demonstrations or empirical demonstrations of its, of its shrinking in humans are few and far between. Uh, so I, I would hold out the hope that the answer is yes, but we don't know yet. I think Joe is going to say something. Maybe. Sorry, wasn't the question on cancer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Was, yeah. I'm not talking about cancer. I won't talk about yeah. cancer. Um, Is yeah. anybody? Are you, Joe, going to talk about I stress can and cancer? That one yeah. Mm. Um, I certainly wouldn't say that stress causes cancer. I'd be very, very cautious of saying anything like that. But there's definitely a role um, for stress um, in cancer in terms of onset and progression. There's good evidence that stress has what it is part of a whole uh, multitude of factors that, that can be associated with it that's definitely my favorite question so far this could be the last question that we've got at the at the back there yeah uh, can mind body interaction and so stress be changed by employing a different philosophical paradigm to that usually used by the person. What do you mean by a philosophical paradigm? Well, a narrow view that um, we can control everything. We're above all metabolic uh, exchanges within our brain. We, we can empower ourselves to do things. You know, we're, we're not, okay. not behaviorist models simplistic behaviours, interactions with the social world. Yeah, I, I, I think I'd be happy to take, take that one. I, I think the idea that we might, there might be something um, above and beyond the, uh, the relationship between the body and the brain, I think all three of us, or four of us, would probably say no, but can we use our, uh, can we use psychological methods and can we use uh, our cognitive skills um, uh, in, uh, to influence interactions between our, our, our brains and our bodies, our brains being parts of our, our, uh, our bodies, then the answer would be yes. And if one wanted to import uh, some kind of, of, of philosophical approach onto that, mindfulness would be um, a, a worthy one uh, and, and, and a one to be taken seriously. But the mechanism, I think, would still be, um, to get back to your question, using... Uh, ways of generating internally uh, those kinds of stimuli which would reduce stress responses rather than, than externally, but something that's outside of the body and the brain, I think we'd all, we'd all suggest no, wouldn't we? We're dyed in the wool mornists. Yeah? Yes. Um, we, have, we have two minutes. Uh, if anybody feels supremely, you feel really cheated, I could tell. So you've got the last, last question. Um, so don't disappoint me. Right. <laughs> You mentioned earlier that um, the second generation of Holocaust survivors have higher stress levels and you don't ha not sure why yet. Is that right? That's what the lady said, I think. Yes. That's right, yes. Well, my father's a Holocaust survivor um, and I'm the second generation. Um, and I think it's because of the... My father has had, like, all his life, he's talked to me about he's lost all his family... Um, he gets very, very stressed easily. Um, I, I go to um, a second generation, that like Holocaust group, and all of us, it's fascinating because we've all had the same experiences. Like, if my father was sitting next to me now, he would tell me, for goodness sake, keep your head down, don't speak, keep quiet. Because one of the, one of the things, for example, is that he learned to survive. He had to keep his head down. Like, don't keep your head up above the parapet because someone will 
kill you, you know? And he's always been like that. And that's how I was brought up, which has made it much harder for me to... Uh, that's just one example. So, of course, I've also grown up more stressed. So I, th I think what, <laughs> what you're alluding to is the psychosocial environment. Yes. Um, and yes, that so most likely is, is the mechanism, um, highly likely. That The work I was talking about is by Rachel Yehuda, who's a very prominent uh, researcher in the, in the US. So um, there's plenty of work to go and have a look at if you want to, to look at that. Yeah, I didn't know. I will do. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's always nice to end on an easy one. <laughs> Don't mean to trivialise it in any way. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, I, I've, I've learned a lot tonight, and I've, I've read the work of the three people and still learned a, a, a lot. The questions have been uh, fantastic. Joel said earlier on that we weren't going to talk about pain tonight. Uh, we weren't going to talk about pleasure. We we're just going to talk about pain. So I think I might be suggesting to Martin that we run one of these on the science of pleasure at some other uh, the day. But for now, could you please thank our three speakers and thank you very much for it. <laughs>